This is Supernatural Speed, Part 5. And it is titled, The Covenant. Supernatural Speed, Part 5. And this is, The Covenant Dimension. In the book of Genesis, chapter 26. And in verse 1, all the way to verse 3. And there was a famine in the land, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerah. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land. And I will be with thee. I will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed, I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto, thy, unto Abraham thy father. Right, verse 12. And Isaac sowed in that land, and received in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. And the man went forward, and grew until he became very great for he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and a great store of servants and the philistines envied him the lord bless his word in the name of jesus tonight our objective is to understand the power of the covenant to produce supernatural speed the power of the covenant in producing supernatural speed a covenant walk with God has been found to be a major secret of supernatural speed Covenant people are strangers to stagnation. Covenant people are never victims of stagnation. Covenant people can never be stranded irrespective of the situation they found themselves. Candidates of the covenant are candidates of drastic and dimensional speed in life. When you look at people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they were men of the covenant and they saw supernatural speed. Please open your ears tonight. You are likely to hear, you are likely to receive, you are likely to understand what you have not heard before or understood before in covenant dimensions. Maybe that was the reason for the hitches we experienced just now. Question is, what is covenant? I'm going to define covenant in two ways. First is the Oxford Dictionary of English, second edition. Oxford e Dictionary of English defines covenant theologically. And this is what it said. It said a covenant is an agreement which brings about a relationship of commitment between God and his people. This is from the English dictionary. This is not Bible definition. He said a covenant is an agreement which brings about a relationship of commitment between God and his people. A relationship of commitment between God and his people. There is an agreement and then there is a relationship and then there is a commitment between God and his people. I define the covenant this way. I said the covenant is a strong level of relationship between two or more parties. Accompanied by mutual responsibility and obligations on the parties involved. 
Again, a covenant is a strong level of relationship between two or more parties that is accompanied by mutual responsibilities and obligations on the parties involved. That is when there is a covenant, there is a relationship that is strong between two or more parties. This, uh, this relationship places upon them mutual responsibilities and obligations that must be performed. That is the covenantee and the covenantor, the two parties. There is, they, they, they have what to do. For example, the covenant between a man and his wife, the covenant of marriage. The husband will love his wife, the wife will submit to the husband, and so on. There is the employment covenant, where there is an employee and the employer, and the covenant is, is performed. The employee will discharge the duties for, the empl for which he or she was employed, and the employer will perform his obligation, the salaries, the remuneration, and so forth. That is covenant, employment covenant. And then we have the covenant of God, the covenant that God has with his people. Abraham walked in covenant. Isaac walked in covenant. Jacob walked in the covenant. David walked in the covenant. There were people in scripture that had practical covenant work with God in the Old Testament. And it produced very drastic results. Beloved, as we go on gradually, I'd like you to open your heart and your ears, especially to the demands of the covenant. Now, let us look at the, the people in, in scripture that had covenant relationship with God and the results they saw. Number one, Abraham. We read about Abraham already in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, all the way to verse 5, where God met with Abraham and called him out of his father's house to the land where he was to show him. And like we said before, everything changed suddenly. Everything speeded up in the life of Abraham as he stepped into a covenant relationship with God. Everything changed. For the sake of time, I think you just reference the scriptures. Everything changed. Abraham remained without a covenant relationship with the God of Israel. He was serving the, the, the gods of the, of the Amorites in the awe of the Chaldees. Until God called him out, entered a covenant with him, and that speeded up Abraham's life. It sped up his life. In Genesis 13, verse 2, where we read, we saw how everything shifted in Abraham's life by reason of the covenant. Example number two is the example of Isaac. That was our text. In Genesis chapter 26, from verse 1 to verse 4, and then verse 12, all the way to verse 14. We saw how there was the famine in the land, and Isaac sowed in the land. He was the covenant partner of God. And by virtue of that action, the man waxed great, went forward, grew until he became very great. He had all manner of possessions until the Philistines envied him. The life of Isaac could not be an ordinary, regular, normal life because he was in a covenant relationship with God. That was Isaac. Third example is the example of Jacob. Jacob was the, 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 the covenant friend of God, with covenant relationship with God, inherited covenant relationship from Abraham, went through Isaac and then from Isaac to Jacob. Jacob was the man who ran from his father's house because Esau was pursuing him to kill him and he ran with just one stick out of his father's house in his own walls with one stick. But God changed his life, the God of covenant. No time tonight to read for you how Jacob entered into covenant with God in Genesis chapter 28 from verse 12 all the way to, to, to the end where he, he fell on, uh, he came to, to the place where he encountered God in Bethel and saw the heavens open angels ascending and descending and then made covenants with God. We don't have the time to read that tonight. But that changed Jacob's life. And when Jacob stepped into the house of Laban, the covenant was not just working on his life, the covenant was working on the life of Laban. In Genesis chapter 30 and in verse 27, 
when Laban was begging Jacob to remain, Laban said unto him, I beg you, if I have found favor in your eyes, wait, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me. Something shifted when you came here. You are, you are such a covenant relationship. You are in such a relationship with God. I don't know what you are carrying, but something shifted when you stepped in here. In verse 30, Jacob said in Genesis 30 and in verse 30, he said it was a little you had before I came, but now it has increased. It has grown. It has multiplied. It has shifted level. Because I came here, I am carrying something. Beloved brothers and sisters, when you are a man, a woman in covenant relationship with God and you are practicing the covenant walk with God the, you see things does not only change for you anything that comes into contact with you changes anybody coming around you just shifts everything around you shifts I've, I've, I've seen several people come around my life and everything shift, shifted one young man told me he said if not that it is too late I would have come to live in your house he said because I've seen many people who came who came around you and they just shifted everything shifted in their lives that is what happens to a real covenant person it is not just that things change for you things change for wherever you are you are whatever is connected related associated with you if you are an employee you are an asset not a liability the organization where you work shift forward because you are there that is what the covenant is all about and I believe that somebody here and somebody everywhere around the world experiencing and hearing what I'm preaching you are about to experience a shift by the power of the covenant in the name of Jesus that was Jacob and everything changed in his life in Genesis chapter 30 and in verse 43 he came to the point where he increased exceedingly. It was immeasurably. He had much cattle. He had men servants. He had maid servants. He had camels. He had asses. The Bible actually made it clear that he became. I sit not sleeping, right? Bible made it clearer that he became bigger than his boss. He became bigger than his boss by the power of the covenant. That was Jacob. You shift from there, you go to Israel. Israel was in the land of Egypt. And there was a lot of affliction and oppression going on in, in the land of Egypt. Yet they exploded in Exodus chapter 1 verse 11. All the way to verse 12. Therefore did they set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. That, that was the covenant people of God multiplying, growing, having progress despite affliction by the power of the covenant one thing you must know from here tonight is that nothing can stop the growth of a covenant person nothing can stop the increase of a real covenant person nothing can stop the progress of a covenant person no level of calamity ad adversity or enemy resistance can stop the breaking forth of a real covenant person the more they afflicted them the more they increased and multiplied i believe that is somebody's story in the name of jesus christ and that was israel the covenant partner of god and now i'm sure you are aware of david David, Genesis, in Psalm 89, verse 33, 34, and 35. He said, nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. He said, my covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness, that I will not lie unto David. David had a covenant work with God. And like we saw the other day, 
David ran, he ran, he ran, he ran. He ran until he outran everybody in his generation. As a prophet and a king and a priest, as a choir director, as a musician, as a, as a, as a vocalist, as a songwriter, as, a, as an inventor of music equipment, as a fighter, as a lion killer, giant killer, military general, people developer, David, worshiper, everything all at once. He ran. And the Bible said in Acts chapter 13, verse 36, after David served his generation, he slept by the will of God. He downloaded. Loaded. He offloaded everything that was uploaded in him. He downloaded, offloaded all of them by the power of the covenant. Beloved, the covenant, the covenant, the covenant, the covenant works and it brings speed. Question. How does the covenant, what are the dividends of the covenant? And when you look at the dividends of the covenant, you will see how the covenant is able to bring about speed and bring about acceleration. What are the death dividends of the covenant? Number one, the covenant connects people. The covenant connects covenant people with divine resources. It connects covenant people with divine resources resources in genesis chapter 14 verse 19 when melchizedek was addressing abraham he blessed him and he said blessed be abraham of the most high god possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be the most high god you see some people thought that he was talking about <clears throat> look at verse 19 again when you read that you said and blessed and he blessed him and said blessed be abraham of the most high god possessor of heaven and earth people thought that don't, don't rush too much bless be abraham of the most high god possessor of heaven and earth people most people read it and think that he's talking about the most high god who is possessor of heaven and earth no that's not what he said he said bless be abraham of the most high god abraham who belongs to the most high god and by belonging to the most high god he has access to everything in heaven and earth and then he went again now to say, I'm blessed be the most high God. See, so he's now talking separately about the most high God. I'm blessed be the most high God. I'm blessed be the most high God. You see, covenant people have access to the resources of their creator. This is what, I, this is what you will understand. Whatever is affordable, affordable by God is available to the covenant practitioner. Whatever is affordable by God is available for the covenant practitioner. What is the meaning of that? The only thing God can give you is what God does not have. The only thing you can access in God is what God cannot avail. Whatever is affordable by God is available for the covenant practitioner. It's available to the covenant practitioner if it is affordable by God. And once that happens to you, speed is inevitable. Once that happens to you, speed is inevitable. That was number one. The covenant connects covenant people with divine resources. Number two, the covenant counters contrary climates and conditions for covenant people it counters contrary climates and conditions for covenant people when the condition is contrary when the climate is contrary the covenant works on it it counters it you see because the covenant is superior to the climate it counters contrary climates and contrary conditions for covenant people when the ground is hard that is where the covenant will work the bible said there was famine in the land isaac sowed in that land and he exploded in that land despite the hardness of the ground that was what we read in Genesis chapter 26 and in verse 12. They, 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 there was famine in the land. And yet, in that hard 
ground. He broke the ground despite the hardness of the ground. The covenant makes you a groundbreaker where grounds are hard. The covenant makes you a groundbreaker where grounds are hard. I'm speaking to somebody here and I believe that in this season the hard grounds around you are breaking now by the power of the covenant watching from Europe and watching from South America and watching from all over the world where the ground is hard hard for spirituality you are struggling to be spiritual hard for 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 business hard for 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 for, for kingdom service basha coco bagada it is broken by the power of the covenant in the same manner israel was in egypt in Exodus chapter 1 verse 11 and 12 they, they, they were afflicting them their taskmasters afflicted them they put burdens everything they did was contrary to growth contrary to multiplication contrary to increase yet they grew and multiplied by the power of the covenant the covenant counters contrary climates and conditions for covenant people is God speaking to anyone here at all? You will say the loudest amen. Do you remember that in the house of Laban, Laban changed the salary, condition of service of Jacob 10 times. In Genesis chapter 31 and in verse 6 to 9, the working condition was not good. And yet, the man is, was still exploding. He said, you know that with all my power, I have served your father. And your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God has not allowed him to hurt me. Go on, all the way to verse 9. If he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the cattle bear speckled. And if he said thus, the ring strict shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring strict. Thus God has taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. By the power of the covenant. The condition of service was contrary. Yet the progress was not touched. The condition of service was disastrous, was negative. But progress remained sustained. Ay, 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 ay. When you are a covenant person, head or tail, you win. Head or tail, you win. In Africa, in America, you win. In Asia, in South America, you win. Anywhere the covenant places you per time, you can't be limited by the climate, by the condition, by the weather, by the circumstance. Because this covenant is superior to any climate. The covenant, that was number two. The covenant counters contrary climates and conditions for covenant people number three the covenant brings exemption in adversity for covenant people it brings exemption in adversity for covenant people this is different from the last point the last point says that if the ground is hard, the covenant makes you to break the ground and make it fruitful. This one is saying if there is generational calamity, there is generational adversity, you are excused. You are exempted. You are excused. That was what happened to the widow of Zarephath. When Elijah arrived in 1 Kings chapter 17 and in verse 13 all the way to verse 16. When Elijah advertised to her one dimension of the covenant... And he said, fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me. And after, make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did it many days, many days, and the barrel of meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Beloved, the covenant, it gives you exemption. It gives you exemption. Where men say they are cast down, you are saying there is a lifting up. When there was a multiple plague in the land of Egypt, there was a place called Goshen. That could not be touched. In Exodus chapter 
8, verse 22 to 23. And Gosh, Goshen was the dwelling place of Israel, of the Israelites. He said, and I will see her in that day, the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end, that, to the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of thee. And I will put a division, that is exemption, between my people and thy people. Tomorrow this sign shall be. In Exodus chapter 9, verse 26, he said it almost the same. He said, only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, were there no hail. Only in the land of Goshen. For as long as this world exists, Famines will come and famines will go. But people of the covenant don't understand the language of famine. If you understand the language of the covenant, you don't understand the language of famine. And hear me. In every Egypt, there is a Goshen. Every season where there is an Egypt, there is inside it a Goshen. There is a place where calamity is not permitted. Where adversity, there is a realm, there is a face. <laughs> there is no church service. And yet at the beginning of the situation of the COVID worldwide, God led us to make some contributions to the authorities of our land here in the season. In the season where people are struggling for how much they can keep back, we still went, made contributions of hospital equipments, including us ultrasound machines, all manner of hospital equipment. Where we gave the equipment at the, the community health center, the overall director said, this place needs somebody to be trained to man this machine. You have come to upgrade this place. While the famine was on, palliative distribution, one, two, three, four, five next week, in a few days' time. While it was on, hospital, I mean, food, and then drugs, to the number two isolation center in the whole country. Were there. While it was on. Our destiny does not depend on what we receive. It depends on our relationship with God. Hear this and hear it well. For everyone who thinks that it is your future is tied to what enters your hand. And for everyone who thinks that church exists for what they can get from people. No! God forbid, this situation shall not continue. <laughs> but I told somebody the other day, I said, even if it is one year, it will not, but if it was, we did. And we'll keep on it, helping and distributing and releasing. And there are testimonies you can't share. Because there are many things that will be misunderstood and there are some devils who don't hear anything except what to hear to criticize. So I won't talk about ourselves. But one of our sons in the ministry, all the way from Southern Africa, he said that this period where everything has been locked down has been their best. He said they saw more, more resources as a people than they had ever seen when everything was normal. That is covenant power. Covenant power. It gives you exemption. Yeah, well, so a, a, a woman we gave food to, okay, I think she, she sold, was it at DSTV or something, decoder or something, and distributed food to people. Did something, I can't remember the details of what she did. Yes. She was giving money to eat. She used half of it. To buy a decoder and use half to buy food, a decoder to watch Dynamics TV and then use half to buy food and distribute to people. That was her offense. Heaven opened. No room to receive what came in.
covenant. It brings exemption in adversity for covenant people. Don't forget this. If all that you heard tonight is this statement. In every Egypt, there is a Goshen. And in every adverse climate, there is a covering. It is called the covenant. Beloved, that is why people are meant to remain in covenant relationship and walk with God before challenges appear. You, don't, you build your house before the sight of rain. You take, you, 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 you build, you, 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 you make your preparation before the confrontations. Now, those who only depended on salary, what they make, what enters their pocket is their survival. Nothing. I mean, uh, what, what, how the, the, the money they made here and there, and there is no connection with what comes from above. This will be their worst season, whether they are rich or poor. The covenant brings exemption in adversity for covenant people. Number four, the covenant brings divine wisdom, ideas, and inspiration for covenant people. It brings divine wisdom, ideas, and inspiration. Divine wisdom, ideas, and inspiration for covenant people. And that will bring you speed. Look at Abraham. Before Abraham's time, nobody heard that people would dig wells in order to water their cattle. Normal cattle rearing was like roaming about. Abraham, according to what we know from scripture, will be, will, can be referred to as the first cattle rancher. He, he had ranching where the animals were watered. Where they were fed and he exploded. That is wisdom. I'm not sure he read it from anywhere. Even the mystery of Titan that Abraham initiated. Nobody before him did it and it wasn't written anywhere before he started. It connects you with divine wisdom, divine ideas, divine inspiration. Isaac can be called the first irrigation farmer. Why? There was dry land. There was famine, no rain, yet he was planting. And I, what was he using to water the plant? His own watering, his own watering system that was independent of the rain. No wonder he went further to start redigging the wells of his father in order to continue his irrigation. And he exploded in the land. That was Isaac. And now you talk about Jacob. Where did he read that technology from? That if you paint picture before animals that are mating and drinking water, then the animals will give birth according to the color they are seeing. That's nothing. That was a spiritual genetic engineering that was changing the genetics of the animals by the wisdom of God. In Genesis chapter 30, verse 37 to 38, we saw... How Jacob preferred to that process. Say Jacob took, a raw, took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree. He peeled white streaks. He peeled white streaks in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods. Now you are wondering, who, how did you know that this can be done? In, in Genesis 31, chapter 10, verse to 12, he began to refer to a dream he dreamt. And it came to pass at the time that the cattle conceived that I lifted up my eyes and I saw in a dream. And behold, the rams which leaped upon the cattle were ring streaked, speckled, and grizzled. And the angel of God spoke to me in that same dream, saying, Jacob, and, and I said, Here I am. And he said, lift up now your eyes and see. All the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring straight, speckled and grizzled. For I have seen all that labor and do it unto you. You see? He, he, he saw the painting of what he was to paint in the day, in a dream. As a covenant practitioner. So it's beyond physical resources. 
And when the ideas come, when the inspiration come, wh whether you are a pastor or you are a business person or you are a career person or a student, an academician or an inventor, the practice of the covenant can open you up and you will be shocked where that will take you. Hallelujah. Number five, the covenant is a supernatural fertilizer for increase and multiplication. All right. It's a supernatural fertilizer unto increase and multiplication for covenant people. It's a supernatural fertilizer unto increase and multiplication for covenant people. Anything the covenant person touches explodes beyond the non-covenant person. That's confirmed. That is very, very much confirmed. The yield of a non-covenant person is not permitted to match that of a covenant person in any way. The yield, the yield, the yield, the yield. We saw that already in Exodus chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, how that they were multiplying despite affliction. We saw that in Genesis chapter 26, verse 12 to, to 14, how Isaac sowed in the land and things were exploding. We saw also in the widow of Zarephath, 1 Kings chapter 16, or 1 Samuel chapter 16 from verse... 17 from verse 13 to 16. We saw that explosion. Beloved brothers and sisters, we have seen in history covenant practitioners. Almost every reference I came across, the man called John D. Rockefeller mentioned his strictness as a follower of God Mentioned that he never smoked nor drank. And mentioned that he tithed from the first one dollar. His mother having taught him. There may be other stories. But this is the one I know is, is consistent in everything I read concerning that man. And he became so wealthy. First dollar billionaire. And became the basis of the number one oil company in America, I think it was National Oil at that time. It was so big until they said, no way. The whole of the Congress said, this man is too big. He has monopolized everything. He, he, he has all the shares. Break your companies. And, and he still divided the companies into three or four. I hear that Chevron, I hear that uh, Texaco, um, Exxon, Mobil. <laughs> all just... And he still had the shares in all of them. The first dollar billionaire in the world is tied to covenant practice. Others were doing the same thing he was doing. But it's not possible. It fertilizes unto increase, fertilizes unto multiplication. Covenant. Number six, the covenant connects covenant people to divine favor and opportunities. It connects covenant people to divine favor and opportunities. Joseph in Genesis 29, 39, verse 2 and 21. The Lord was with him. He was a prosperous man. Verse 3. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Next verse, and Joseph found grace, that is favor, in his sight. You look at verse 21, you are seeing the same thing. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Covenant. Look at the children of Israel. When they were about to, before they stepped out of Egypt. Exodus chapter 3 verse 21. God said, he is going to, and I will give these people favor. In the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when you shall go, you shall not go empty. 
I will give them favor. Exodus 11, 3, repeated almost. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. 12, 36. And the Lord gave the people favor. The Lord gave the people favor. You are asking, what is the reason for this favor, favor, favor times three? It is in Exodus chapter 2 verse 21. You will see the reason. And Moses was content now, verse 22. 23. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried. God is so poetic. Died, sighed, cried. And their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. Now look at this. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant. He remembered covenant and released favor. Every time God remembers covenant, he releases favor. He remembered covenant and released favor. You want to walk in, in the realms of favor, in dimensions of favor. Walk in the dimensions of things you never struggled for. Walk in the dimensions of things you never walked for. There is a covenant walk with God that takes you to the realm of favor and opportunities. Don't forget, when God remembers covenant, he releases favor. Number seven, the covenant is doorway. To divine direction for covenant people. The covenant makes it easy for you to hear God. A covenant walk with God. I am in the covenant of marriage with my wife. She doesn't need to struggle to know what is my mind. She doesn't need to struggle to know what I am saying. If she didn't hear me well, she, she will ask me, what did you say, sir? It is, 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 is doorway to divine direction for covenant people. Do you see God spoke to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 from verse 1. And then just verse 7. He hasn't even gone far. Verse 7. God appeared unto Abraham and began to talk. All right. As Abraham moved in verse 5, the voice of God landed in verse 7. That is, I didn't call you to be stranded. I called you, I'm connecting with you to be in touch with you. And God is speaking to Abraham in verse 7. Isaac in covenant with God in Genesis chapter 26 and in verse 1 is speaking to Isaac. There was the famine and God appeared to him. Don't go like other people go. Be in this land. Jacob was a, 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 was a candidate for divine hearing as well. In Genesis chapter 35 and in verse 1. And the Lord appeared to Jacob. Said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel. And dwell there. And make there an altar unto God. That appeared unto thee when thou fledest from the face of Esau thy brother. The covenant work with God is multifaceted in profitability. It's multifaceted. When people are narrow-minded, all about, and they think everything is all about just giving and about just giving and receiving something, it's just narrow-mindedness. And there is more to the covenant even than just giving something and receiving something. Beloved brothers and sisters, here is it. it Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, they had access to divine hearing access to divine direction my covenant walk began almost 34 years ago in the year of 1986 i was still in the high institution i was i, I never planned to be a, a pastor i didn't budget to be a pastor it wasn't in my schedule and nobody preached or taught it to me i saw it from scripture and saw how to walk with god and i can assure you god has helped me so far and it's, and i'm trusting him for more help I didn't struggle to know who to marry. I didn't go to a second person on the matter of marriage. I didn't veer into a second, a second, a second, a second matter concerning ministry or doing the work, what I'm to do with my life. There was no confusion. Why? Because I started with God and by his mercy, he brought me close to him very early. And the direction was very, very sharp, very, very precise, accurate by his help. The covenant brings you into divine direction. Divine direction. Divine direction. Number eight, the covenant activates angelic assignment 
for covenant people. The covenant activates angelic assignment for covenant people. Covenant people never lack the ministry of angels. And that will increase your speed in life, I can assure you of that. Angelic encounters continually. Angelic encounters continually, continually benefiting from the covenant. Genesis chapter 16 verse 7, 7. We saw how the angel was ministering to somebody who was connected to, to the covenant Abraham. That was Hagar. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness. That is, the angel is not just ministering to you, but ministering to people connected, associated with you. In Genesis chapter 28 and in verse 12, we saw how Jacob saw the dream of heaven at Bethel, where the angels were ascending and descending. And that, and that ushered him to another level. In Genesis Chapter 32, and in verse 1, all the way to verse 2, we saw again, and Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of that place, Mahane, verse 3. And Jacob sent messengers. Can you see that? The angels of God met him. They didn't say that the angels of God came and said this or that. They didn't say that the angels achieved this. They, just, they are just his company. They just wanted to let him know we are around, we did. The angels of the Lord met him. And what did, did he do in that meeting? He called the name of that place, Mahanaim, and continued his journey. Oh, guys, thank you for coming. I'm aware. Thank you for being around. We are going. We are proceeding. That is the power of the covenant. Angels exist for preservation, protection. They exist for supply, provision. They exist for battle. The covenant activates angelic activity in the lives of covenant people. Number nine, the covenant guarantees divine health, strength, and vitality for covenant people. Divine health, strength, and vitality. Divine health, strength, and vitality. Divine health, strength, and vitality. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 7. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His natural eye was not dim. His natural, his eye was not dim. His natural force was not reduced. G Moses was the one who, re who received the tablets of the commandments for the children of Israel. See his strength. Abraham, Genesis chapter 25, verse 7 to verse 8. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived. 100, three score, and 15 years. That is 175 years old. And Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, not bad old age. An old man, full of years, and was gathered to his people. That was how the covenant Abraham went to be with the Lord. What about Isaac? Genesis chapter 35, verse 28. It talks about Isaac, and the days of Isaac were a hundred and four score years. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. What about Jacob? Genesis 47, verse 28. The same with Jacob. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was a hundred and forty-seven years. One, four, seven. Strength. Shakalabe. The reason why you must understand this is because revelation provokes reality. Revelation is seed for manifestation. What you know determines what you show. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed belong to us. Your revelations determine your possession. There are things you can do, but if you don't know the dividends of what you do, you don't have the faith to demand for them. There is a lifestyle you can be living in God. I mean, in the village, there are people who tight, have been tightening forever. I mean, there are people who do, there are some very, very pious Christians, you know, but 
highly afflictable also by the devil because they are not they, are, they don't know the benefits of the service covenant for example very important to know that was number nine and finally number ten the covenant guarantees divine protection and preservation for covenant people divine protection and preservation for covenant people you are not an easily wasteable material Genesis chapter 20, verse 1, when Abimelech tempered with Abraham's wife, God visited him and told him, you are a dead man. Was that verse 4? You are a dead man. Because the person, no, back up a bit, verse 2 or 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, you are a dead man. Because you have touched the wife of my covenant partner. Isaac in Genesis 26 verse 16. The Bible said he was bigger than the Philistines. Genesis 31 verse 24. God appeared to Laban in the night and warned him. Don't dare Jacob. If you want, don't want trouble, leave him alone. So when he woke up in the morning. Anything he had in mind to talk to Jacob about. He couldn't dare it. Genesis 35. And in verse 5, Jacob and his family journeyed. And the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. And they could not pursue after the sons of Jacob. I prophesy to somebody here. The devil and his agents will see the terror of God around your life. And they will never be able to pursue. In Job chapter 1 and in verse 10, Job had the wall of fire around him. He was a covenant practitioner. Has thou not made an hedge about him and about his house? And about all that he has on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. That was Job. Psalm 25, verse 1 to 5, look at David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Psalm 27, verse 1 to 5. The Lord is my light, he is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart, heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacles sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yeah. I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hallelujah. That is covenant. Protection. Preservation. Beloved, it is good to understand it. In conclusion tonight, what is the secret of the covenant? The secret of the covenant is the altar. The secret of the covenant is the altar. People of covenant are people of altars. Don't forget it. They are people of altars. Genesis chapter 8 verse 20, Noah builded an altar. Genesis chapter 12, verse 7 and 8. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto him, Thy seed will I give this land. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. People of sacrifices are people of altars. Genesis 26, 25, Isaac. Now, I've, I've showed you Noah. I've showed you Abraham. And I've showed, I'm showing you Isaac now. And he builded an altar, that's Isaac, there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dig the well. He builded an altar. Sacrifice calls for altar. I mean, covenant calls for altars. What about Jacob? Genesis chapter 35 and in verse 1, the Bible is speaking about 
Jacob. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fledest from the face of Esau thy brother. Altar. What about Moses? Plenty of altars. I'll just mention one. Exodus 17, 15. That was Moses. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. Very, very quickly. What does the altar represent? That is your covenant. What is your covenant demand? What is your covenant obligation? Number one, altar equals number one, consecration. Consecration. That is, what your relationship with God is costing you, consecration. Because your relationship with God will place demands on you. Demand. At times it will be demands of disconnection. For Abraham, it was a disconnection. Disconnection from certain relationships. Disconnection from certain habits or lifestyles. It may even be disconnection from certain vocations or action steps. Hear me? Disconnection from, relation, from certain relationships. Disconnection from certain habits or lifestyles. Disconnection from certain vocations, certain actions. Cost Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 or 2. Get out of your father's house. From your kindred, from your tribe. It cost, it cost Gideon. Go and throw down the altar of Baal in your father's house. That was Judges, I think, chapter 6, verse 16, there about. If your relationship with God has not cost you anything, you don't have a covenant walk with God. There are things God may ask you never to watch. There are, I, 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 there are things that may be harmless in the eyes of the world or the eyes of others. That is why you don't compare what others are doing with what you are to do. The demand that was placed on Samson concerning his life was not placed on Elijah, for example. Samson was not to drink anything that was fermented. He was in Nazareth from his mother's womb. Altar represents consecration. It may affect your, your, your manner of dress, your appearance, your look. Affected, that is the most important determinant of your life's action is your maker, not even yourself. That's covenant. The most important determinant of your behavior, the most important determinant of your action steps, the most important determinant of what you can do, who you can connect with, is your maker, not even yourself. Altar represents consecration. Number two, it represents devotion. We talk about prayer altar. We talk about prayer altar, consecration, I mean, prayer altar, relationship altar, devotion. First Kings chapter 18, verse 30, you realize that Elijah repaired the altar before he called down the fire. In, in verse 30, he repaired the altar. In verse 36, he began to pray to call the fire. You cannot have fire when you don't have an altar. It is not possible to have spiritual fire when your spiritual altar is in decadence. Altar. And Abraham rose up in the morning. Genesis chapter 19 verse 27. To the place where he stood before God. Covenant means you have a, 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 a concrete devotional relationship with God. A prayer life that is buoyant and vibrant. A prayer life that flows into fasting as well. God knows you know that you and God have appointment recurrently, consistently. Altar equals consecration. 
What you'll be asking God tonight is, is there anything in my life I need to give up in my relationship with you? Is there something you are making demands on? What you are to ask God tonight is, is my spiritual life all right? Is my prayer life, study of the word, fasting schedule, okay? And you know your devotion affects your acceleration. Do you know that? They that wait on the Lord. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31. They shall renew their strength. Wait on the Lord at, at, at the place of prayer. At the place of fasting. They, at, at the place of the world. They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Actually I was meant to preach a whole message. On. Supernatural speed, dash, waiting on the Lord. But let's suffice it for it to be in here. Your devotion affects your acceleration. The quality of your weight on God affects the intensity of your speed in life. Altar represents consecration. For some people, just one thing is holding you back from seeing what you are meant to see with God. For some people, your, 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 your prayer life is too distracted. Everything distracts you. Phone, WhatsApp, YouTube, Facebook. Everything distracts you. Altar represents consecration, number two, devotion. And number three, donation. Donation. That is, your life is not yours. It belongs to God. Donation. He said, I beseech you, therefore, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of the living God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Living sacrifice. That is yourself, you are a sacrifice. And in Psalm 118, verse 27, Psalm 118, verse 27, he said, God is the Lord. Which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice. And what sacrifice? Yourself. Living sacrifice with cords. Even unto the horns of the altar. Lay yourself on the altar. Give yourself to God. Let him own you. Own you. Own you. Own you. No wonder he said in Psalm 50 verse 5. He said, gather my sins together. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice gather them together donation when people are talking of give gift offering tight those are kindergarten matters kindergarten matters for anybody who doesn't know god tight is a matter it's an issue For people who have donated their lives to God, tight is the least that you, you have given your life, given your time, your energy, your, your resources. You have given everything about you. Paul the Apostle was talking about the saints in Macedonia. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4 and 5, he was talking about how they gave to them. And how he said, pray, they said they were begging us with so much begging that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints. He said, and this they did, not as we hoped. That is beyond what we ever imagined. Because they first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. They gave themselves to God. So any minor giving is, is nothing. I, God brought me to the point where there is nothing under heaven that can't be given. Nothing. That's everything, every single thing. In case you are playing to it, you, you don't understand what it means to be donated, to be sacrificial. First of all, ask God, help me to know that I don't own my life. I don't own my breath. I don't own my, my oxygen. So,
giving and any other thing becomes more than a delight because your whole life belongs to God. Other people try to make money so that they can prove a point. You are trying to see how much resources can God give me to the extent to which I can move his agenda on earth forward. How much resources can I use to move his agenda forward, impact lives, impact destinies, impact time and eternity? Of little offering, mega tight, becomes shadows as far as what you are doing for God or what you want to do with your life is concerned. Those have been done. And yet there is in a, a, a gnawing hunger in your heart to touch eternity, touch humanity. So in case you don't understand donation of your life to God, you don't understand devotion, and you don't understand consecration, that is what the altar is about. That is what covenant is about. Move and ask God, what is it I am holding on to that I'm meant to relinquish? How much prayer life and study and fasting am I meant to be living in and I'm playing with my life? I'm sorry for holding back from you. My whole life is yours. Nobody will ever beg me for the rest of my life to do covenant obligations, practices, in advancing my life, advancing the kingdom in the earth. I want you to make this conference your determination. From this moment forward, you don't need to be cajoled, to be taught, to be begged, or to be, or to be convinced. You convince yourself through the scripture. And you walk and you see speed that will amaze your life. Is a new day in the name of Jesus. Be up on your feet and lift up your hands and give him the praise.